My story begins here at this tree in the suburbs of Connecticut, where once stood one of many forts of the Pequot Nation. As families slept, the fort was set ablaze and startled men, women, and children were shot as they fled the inferno. All because of the greedy eyes of the European traders who desired the plentiful Pequot lands. Stripped of their freedom and their lands, they lived a scarce existence on the reservation. This is what remains of the cabin where my grandmother lived until she married. I arrived on the scene in 1969, the youngest of four. I enjoyed all the things that most kids enjoyed. Bike riding, the beach, and hanging out with friends. I loved visiting my Aunt Pink, who volunteered at the White Cloud Indian Center and attending church and tribal socials on the weekends. I had a loving family who worked hard to have what others took for granted, like heat and hot water. In high school and college, I worked a lot of jobs and drove many miles to get through. I found a tiny apartment and took a job so low paying, I had to pawn my own things to put gas in my car to get to work. Eventually, a better job did come along, and I thought I had made it. I thought I would marry, have kids, and live out my life. My parents were nearing retirement and pretty much broke. I wasn't sure how, but I would find a way to help care for them when they retired. In a blink of an eye, life took a turn. Three, two, one, fly. At 23, I was me. At 24, I was a casino Indian. Because of the financial stability, the income from the casino provided my tribe, I was able to do things that I could only dream about before. I traveled the country, the world, and indulged my love of cars. I continued on with college and became the first in my family to graduate with a bachelor's degree. Best of all, I no longer had to worry about my parents, who moved into new elders' housing on the reservation. But to all that was positive came to all that was negative. I eagerly accepted a position as a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., thinking I would help my tribe and others who were still struggling. I was there for the inauguration of G.W. Bush, but I also attended many rubber chicken dinners. I was insulted by people questioning my tribe's legitimacy while politicians asked for contributions. How much Indian blood I had was suddenly of great importance. What seemed like attempts at friendship by other Native people were often opportunities to ask for a job or pick my brain about tribal business. Trashy books, news, and movies about casino Indians were everywhere and were an insult to me, my tribe, and my ancestors. I was asked strange questions like, how did you find out you were Indian? Even friends that I had grown up with said, hey, I knew you were Indian, but not that kind of Indian. Your family was nice, you deserve it. Almost like federal recognition was only deserved if you were nice. I gave loans that would never be repaid and so-called friends vanished. Tired from all the craziness, I returned home, settled down, and focused on cultural activities and people who enjoyed the same. Looking back, life seems like a crazy dream, and money certainly doesn't fix everything. Stress, illness, and death are still part of life. The Creator has given more than one deserves, but I still worry for my children's future. The hungry eyes of politicians and the public chip away at tribal sovereignty, and poor decisions by tribal leaders leave my tribe vulnerable. It's been over 300 years, and my children and I have been returned to our ancestral wigwam beneath this tiny tree.